Many of us will remember September 2008 as the most memorable month in recent history. That month alone rocked the entire world. Hi, this is Steve Sia from Digital Asset. Many of us will remember September 2008 as the most memorable month in recent history. That month alone rocked the entire world when Metallica dropped its ninth album, Death Magnetic. All right, I'm joking. Something else happened in September 2008, and maybe Metallica's album and the songs in it sort of predicted what was coming in a matter of days. Take a look. Mmm, not good. Let me try to give you a very compressed version of what happened on September 2008 other than Metallica's album. On September 15, 2008, Lehman Brothers filed for bankruptcy. And this was a big deal. Lehman Brothers have been around for 158 years. They were worth $700 billion, and they've invested in the earlier years in coffee, to retail, to aviation, and then into real estate. And their bankruptcy led to one of the saddest, biggest, and traumatic stock market crashes in recent history. Now, what led to their demise can be traced back to something called a subprime mortgage. A subprime mortgage is a home loan, a mortgage, that is given to a borrower with very unfavorable terms. The reason why they are unfavorable is because their interest rates are really high. And the interest rates are really high because these borrowers are risky. And what made people really mad was that they believed that the banks, the retail banks that issues and gives these loans, knew that. So you have these borrowers who will probably default on their loan, which means they can't pay mortgage anymore. And that, that would have been fine. But these loans were packaged by the retail banks and sold to groups like Lehman Brothers, the investment banks, because the idea is that with a wide, big, fat portfolio of these loans, the mortgages paid by these borrowers would generate revenue. Well, you can make a guess what happened. Four months after the stock market crash, something very interesting happened in January of 2009. A person or a group of people by the name of Satoshi Nakamoto initiated a wire transfer of Bitcoin to another party, specifically to the late computer scientist Hal Finney. This was a big deal because it marked the birth of Bitcoin. It proved that it works, that, that digital money could be transferred from party A to party B without going through a middleman, without going through a central bank. Now, the stock market crash of September 2008 and the birth of Bitcoin are forever linked together, and for good reasons. But it's important to remember that Bitcoin and blockchain has existed prior to the crash of the stock market. Many people talk about the origins of Bitcoin by pointing to the stock market crash in 2008, when in reality, the concept of blockchain and digital money have existed prior to the crash. Now, could the concept of a cryptocurrency save or prevented the stock market crash? Maybe. Um, at a time of taping, we have not seen an implementation of cryptocurrency in the, in the, in the real estate lending space. So the debate is still out there, but I would say that they are related. And then let's just call them a big coincidence. I like that. So just to be very clear, we have this technology called blockchain, which gave birth to cryptocurrency. And what this video series is all about is a sibling of cryptocurrency called smart contracts. All right, I know I'm going really fast. Let me slow down. Let's go back to blockchain and make sure that we understand what that's all about. 
There are many great videos, by the way, on YouTube, on TED Talks that talk about blockchain and explain them in a comprehensive manner. But this is the 60 second version. Some databases would store data in a very Excel-like format where there's rows and columns. So if I want to change a particular cell, I would identify the data, find where it is, and then I go into the cell and I see, hey, Steve, so let me change it to Steven, enter, save. Other databases would store things in a uh, key value system where you have to look up the key, say Steve, I'm um, sorry, name, and then you find the value, Steve, and you go in and you change it to Steven. In blockchain, you do not do that. In blockchain, you have to preserve the old data. So if there's new data, you preserve the old one and you add a new one, thereby creating a chain. Now, what happens when you go back and fudge your data? Suppose I drove a Toyota uh, five years ago and I want people to believe that I drive a Ferrari. So I would go in and change it to Ferrari. Guess what? There's not only one copy of the records, which we call the ledger. There are multiple ledgers involved. So if I were to change my record to Ferrari, everybody else is saying that I drive a Toyota. That's it. That's blockchain. And Toyotas are perfectly fine cars. Now, when you put it all together, you have a digital record keeping system of records of transactions that are immutable, cannot be changed, and is distributed and decentralized and importantly duplicated. Now, all this together is called the ledger. The ledger is the record-keeping system that is blockchain. So this unique way of storing data is touching all kinds of industries from banking and finance to currency, healthcare, records of property, supply chain, voting, and all that is made possible by the sibling of cryptocurrency called smart contracts. We'll look at that mix. See you next time. Three months after September 2008, four months, four months after the stock market crash.